Welcome this afternoon. Uh, the title of this uh, session is Transitioning to No-Till. I'm uh, Jeff Stockler. I'm one of the moderators for this group. Uh, and what we're going to get started with first is a panel discussion. Um, we've got uh, David Brandt, uh, a no-till farmer, Bill Richards, uh, the former chief of USDA NRCS, uh, Brett Margraff, uh, Seneca Soil and Water Conservation District, and Bill Lemko with uh, Precision Ag Services. And uh, Randall Reeder here is going to uh, moderate this uh, part of the program. All right. And uh, you've got a legendary panel up here. Uh, I, re I retired as an extension ag engineer at Ohio State University, but I'm going to try not to avoid answering any questions. I'm mainly just the, uh, the cop keeping things straight. Our main emphasis is going to be answering your questions. So that's what we're really interested in. But let me add a couple of things. Now, not only are you heard the names of these folks up here, but uh, the one you're closest to me is one of 25 living legends of no-till. Uh, key there is living. Uh, and uh, these were presented at the National No-Till conference in St. Louis in January. Uh, another living legend is at the other end, and here, hold on to that, Dave. You stand up. <laughs> you can try. You can A legend means you're, you're an old guy. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, so, okay. so, Bill could not be at the uh, St. Louis Convention, so uh, I brought the plaque here, and I figured this would be a good, good time to present it. Thank yes. you. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Yes. And speaking of living legends of no-till, Paul, stand up. Paul Yassa, who spoke here three times yesterday, he's another one of those 25. So we're delighted to have uh, so many here. I was involved in a conference in Denver, 1st of February, and there were six of the living legends there at that conference. So you can tell um, once you get named into that category, we keep you busy all the time. Uh, and Bill Lemko has won a national award also. Uh, he's not a living legend yet, but uh, one of the top uh, top people in, in no-till, both as a business person and, and as a farmer. And it was interesting that his uh, partner, employee, Tim Burning, received the um, CCA Award of the Year yesterday. So we've got top people up here. We're going to have to get Brad an award somehow. <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's feeling all left out. Uh, transitioning to no-till. Um, what are, uh, just take topics if you don't have a question. What are some of the first things that you would think of as an issue or something that needs to be addressed for you or for any farmer converting from a conventional tillage system or even those that no-till every other year, for example, uh, switching to continuous no-till. So what topics or what questions come up? Incorporating fertilizer. <laughs> yeah, and, and get rid of that word incorporating uh, as it relates to fertilizer. What's the right word we're going to use from now on? Injecting. Injecting. All right. Uh, but th that's a good question. And, and to broaden that out, what about lime? And if you spread lime on the surface, is it ever going to get down to where the roots are? Uh, what else? Keep all these questions in mind, fellas. Drainage. Uh, you think drainage is going to be worse with no-till? Ah, okay. The point is, if you have poorly drained soil, you have to have good drainage to be successful with no-till. Back there. Eliminating all these different compactions. Ah, eliminating compaction layers. And I think a good question for that is, can you do that with cover crops? We'll get to that in a little bit. Why don't you just start with a good attitude and say, no kill, I'll answer all the questions. <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think he said, just, 
just start with the better, with a good attitude and eliminate all the issues. And one way to do that is somebody told me an example of a farmer that just sold all of his equipment and all he had left was the no-till equipment. So he didn't have a choice but to make it work. Yeah, Brian. Uh, yield lag in the first couple of years. Ah, how do you, and I'll rephrase it, how do you, how do you reduce or eliminate any yield lag in that first first or second year of no-till. And I've heard solutions that there are answers to that, yeah. Managing slugs and voles and other things that love cover crops, <laughs> right. Okay, are, there, are, are you in it? Okay, Brett will answer that. He understood the question better than I did. I think. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, what county are you in? Oh, okay. All right, is $10 an acre enough to incentivize or cause somebody to switch to continuous no-till? And Bill Richards is, uh, I told him that he can focus on, well, besides talking about <laughs> the fun the fun that he had transitioning to no-till 40 years ago, uh, but he can also talk about uh, the government relations and issues that might be related to USDA, uh, well, the Farm Bill and other USDA decisions. Other questions or issues? All right, well, okay, one more. That's a Bill Lemko question. Yes, how do you how do you set up the planter for no-till, and is it going to be any different? If you buy a new planter today, is it going to be ready for no-till, pretty much without any major adjustment? All right, let's begin. So, what what do you got there first, Brett? First, injecting nutrients and fertilizer, and uh, the issues that go with uh, fertilization. Um, well. One of the things that's happening in, in the northern water, uh, northern counties up by Lake Erie is with some of our EQIP programs, um, we are eligible for some cost share up there and, and uh, nutrient management plans in specific, like enhanced nutrient management. And one of the ways that we're able to work around that with farmers is by being able to apply on something growing and living. So it, we're not necessarily always injecting it, but by applying on a growing crop out there is one of the avenues that allows guys to keep within compliance of, of some of the programs that might give them some cost incentive payments and still be able to get the nutrients that they desire. I, I believe that we need to go back to the way it was uh, 45 and 50 years ago when Bill and I started. Uh, we were putting all the nutrients we needed in a two by two band. Uh, we got away from that and uh, I think that's coming back. There's a lot of planters I see today that now have fertilizer openers that are doing what we need to do. Uh, it's really tough to put nutrients on the surface, uh, especially without a cover crop. It's just going to no-till and not and have it stay, uh, because when you know if you don't have a cover crop there to hold what you're putting on, it will uh, probably slide off before it goes down through the profile. Uh, application of lime, we've never faced a liming problem no-tilling. Uh, as you get cover crops and do no-till, earthworm populations go up and uh, they tend to broom, take that lime down through the profile. Uh, on our farm today, our biggest problem is when we spread cover crops, the earthworms will take it down two or three inches deep before he gets a chance to sprout. So that's one thing we've seen. Bill, you want to comment? You know, I, I first thought, you know, uh, as fertilizer stays expensive and as corn and beans go down, uh, we're going to be maybe going back to really putting that fertilizer where we get the most out of it. Right. Uh, we also are going to have the machinery now to get that job done. And there's also going to be all kind of public pressure, I mean, to, 
to uh, make sure that uh, we're doing and using the best technology that we can in placing those nutrients. And then I think this is going to dovetail in on some of the other questions here a little bit, what I'm going to say. One of the things as you move from conventional tillage into no tillage and want to make that transition, uh, two things that with, there's a lot of things need to happen. One, of course, it was brought up, drainage needs to be addressed, so we've got good drainage on the field. Uh, number two is, is the nutrients that are out there. We need to know where our soil tests are at. We need to know what, for example, our calcium-magnesium ratio is at. So we need good, well-balanced fertility out there before we even think of transitioning into no-till and cover crops. And then the third thing, and we'll bring this up here probably some more on some of the other questions, is <clears throat> you guys need to dig in your cornfields. If you're in conventional tillage and want to go to no-till, you need to dig out there. And I'm not talking, it's better to do with a backhoe so you can dig a soil pit and dig a fairly large one and see what you've got. But a shovel and a spade does just fine, but you need to see what those corn roots are telling you. If you've got layers out there that are going to prevent water infiltration and water movement, nutrient movement, and, and things like that, those got to be addressed first uh, before you make that big leap into no-till. You know, how are you going to do that? You know, <clears throat> cover crops will help some, but if you've got a bad enough situation, I hate to say it, you're going to have to address, you may have to address that with some cold, hard, hard steel initially to take those layers out and then let cover crops then continue that transition from there in with your no-till. So, but, I mean, we've got all kind of questions leading into this, so. Uh, anything else relating to getting fertilizer and lime and getting that part of the soil corrected? Why are you still talking about uh, fertilizer? Does anhydrous have a fish in the no-till system, and how would you see it uh, from a conventional system into a no-till system? My personal opinion is anhydrous does not belong in a no-till system. <laughs> 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 I mean, we've been wrong for about 40 years, right? <laughs> well, we're, we're on anhydrous. Uh, you look at the prices in the past, you just can't afford not to use anhydrous. We'd probably think that we're getting a little bit of tillage with that knife. We have a knife every 40 inches in 20 inch uh, rows. So we're still applying anhydrous. We're uh, worrying about the uh, compaction from the, from the fertilizer wagon. And uh, we're, I'll wait till we get a compaction question before I start <laughs> going down that line. Anybody else? Well, that didn't help you much. That didn't help you much. <laughs> yeah, right. We'll use anhydrous until they take it away from us. It's probably the most correct answer. That's right. Yeah. yeah. All right. What's the next question? Is there point you actually cut back nutrients, or do you continue to use it at the same rate so it's comfortable? Repeat that. So your question is, is, is there any point in time do you start to cut back on nutrients in that? My philosophy behind that is soil test, soil test, soil test. I mean, you need to watch, you know, granted soil testing is only part of that equation. You need to keep track of, you know, crop removal and things like that. But if you're going to be, and, and Dave can help answer this, Dave and Brett, or all of us, but um, as you introduce cover crops into... Your, your into the uh, equation and that the, the uh, need, I think everybody can agree, the need for some of those nutrients is going to decrease. So, Right, and I, th I think if you're, if you're working with legume cover crops, there is a way that you can justify to reduce those, uh, especially the end requirement, uh, probably is the first one you can reduce uh, slightly to start with. Uh, the longer you're in a no-till and cover crop system that put uh, legumes in that mix, uh, you can uh, continue to adjust that. Uh, whether you hit a point where you can do zero nitrogen, uh, 
I cannot. I haven't hit that point yet. We're trying awful hard to get there, but some years it's just different than other years. And uh, the best way I can tell you to figure out what you want to do is always go to the field before you plant and take the shovel and dig those roots of those cover crops. See how much uh, nodulation you have. See if they're uh, red or pinkish. Uh, I prefer dark red because it's, they're more alive. Uh, then it has ability to translocate into putting 50 or 60 pounds of nitrogen down uh, to help you, you know. Yeah, well, as you, you know, you make a plan to try to do something, uh, any kind of change, you have a plan in place, and as part of that plan, I think it certainly needs to be a goal. Uh, one of the many goals that you're wanting to achieve is going to be some nutrient reduction, so, you know, input costs, because that's, that's the whole point of this whole system. Right. Is is to be more efficient and and you know save a little bit of money. Yes. Well, I think I think that's really true because that's how we've learned. You know, uh, today with the combines with yield monitors. Uh, prior to that, it was a little more difficult to find a way buggy or. You know, a lot of times we use our ground and mixer mill because that had the scales on it. It was the same as a way buggy for us. And you would go out there and you could remember where you didn't put any on or maybe you put half rates on and and then full rates and compare those two. And, you know, if, if uh, you've used a little round figure 150 pounds in for 150 bushel corn and the next one's only 75 pounds in, and at harvest time, it's, be, it's after the fact, but if the 75 pounds yielded as much as the 150, I always figured we gained 75 pounds of nitrogen. It's history, but then you have an idea what to do next year. But like we say, the weather changes that, so you always have to monitor that crop. You need to be out there in those fields, uh, and just don't think that just because you use three legumes, you got 50 pounds of nitrogen or 500 pounds of nitrogen. Look at your plants. You know, if, if the leaves are yellow at the bottom, uh, it's not picking up the nitrogen. Do something about it. You know, always leave that, uh, what I call, escape door open so, you know, you can go back and side dress or maybe you need to use a, another shot of herbicide or something. And I think for beginners, the best thing you can do is put where you're starting as close to the house or wherever the most pressure is from your neighbors because... They're going to tell you whether you're failing or not, and you're going to tell yourself. So be committed to what you do. I mean, if you only try five acres in a transition of a thousand acres, it's really not going to make any difference whether it makes it or not. Get enough planted out there that it affects uh, the terminology is not going to be right, but it affects your wallet if you don't do it a good job. You know, so that becomes your, you need to learn to how to manage. My, what I try to tell people is the time you spent sitting on a tractor seat doing the tillage or doing plowing or whatever you're doing, that same amount of time needs to be in the field with a shovel. You know, and that's not doing 30 mile an hour looking out the windshield of the pickup truck because that's when it's going to bite you. Because those front two rows in the field look really good, but then back two around the woods may all be ate up with insects or something. You know. So you need to spend time there. And that's the hardest thing to get across to people. Take that time, you know, to do the right management. Let's move on, let's move on to another one of your questions. Brad, how about planters? Yeah, let's, 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 the question was setting up planters. And All right, uh, setting up a planter for uh, switching to no-till. <laughs> Bill Lemko has some experience with setting up planters. How many, all right, I'm going to ask this. How many in here, let's have a show. This is where the audience participation part comes in. How many in here are doing no-till? Let's have a show of hands or have tried it. All right, how many in here are still running a no-till colder? There's a few, okay. <clears throat> We've seen a lot of transition guys going away from running the no-till colder. It does depend a little bit on your soil type and environment. And also, if you need to run that no-till coulter as a shock absorber for your row units, so, so to speak, if you have some rock. But from, from beyond that standpoint, um, <clears throat> we've seen a lot of detrimental effects from the no-till coulter, depending on, depending on what kind of coulter blade you're running up front. 
from the standpoint of uh, <clears throat> moving too much dirt uh, or soil out of the out of the seed trench and and in front of those gauge wheels and and throwing that dirt that soil <clears throat> where the gauge wheels do run, and so we've got some uneven, uneven seating depth problems there. We've seen some of that. Um, <clears throat> so just keep that in mind uh, and some of those types of issues. But you know, beyond the basics of leveling your planter and things like that, it's going to depend on what kind of cover crops you're running, whether you're going to have some success with the row cleaners and, and things like that, or whether you're just going to go in with, you know, your uh, your bare uh, seed opening discs and and a good closing wheel system to uh, get that seed trench closed back up and that's probably the biggest topic out there and where we get the most questions is <clears throat> all right where, what do we do as far as closing wheel system and uh, I can throw out what a lot of people say as an answer well it depends. <laughs> But there, there's probably 28, 28 to 35 different vintages of closing wheels out there. And, you know, it's kind of fun to go around the National Farm Machinery Show and see who invented what or came out with one, what. And I can assure you some of those are probably nothing short of blunt force trauma on the seed trench. They're that bad. So just keep that in mind, what you're trying to do. Um, as far as closing that up, we need to know, you know, what type of what type of cover crop are we running in? Do we need to worry about wrapping uh, things like that? So there's some different closing wheels on the market that, if you're going into uh, cereal rye or something like that, to perform rather well compared to some of their counterparts that would wrap. So uh, <clears throat> for uh, there's nothing wrong with a uh, cast iron closing system as well. Uh, <clears throat> just need to be cognizant of uh, the conditions back there and how much weight you have in that actual closing wheel system. So the best thing to do <clears throat> is get off the get off the tractor and dig and, and see what that see what we're seeing uh, out there as far and I tell you to dig, I want you to dig from outside of closing wheel to outside of closing wheel, not just your true V, not just not just not be checking seed depth. Let's see what we're co doing clear across that entire soil profile of that row unit. So let's see if we're running too much down force uh, where the gauge wheel tires are run. We want to see if we're knitting that seam shut uh, with our closing wheel system and getting good uh, consistency, we don't have any air pockets or anything like that uh, in the seed trench. So, <clears throat> I mean, we could go on for hours on basic planter setup. Yeah, I just saw Bill more talk specific, for an hour on that. More specific questions, we can do that. But I know uh, there's a lot. We'll let both these guys that have done it a while talk too. So, you know, the one thing I don't think happens enough is I don't think people go to their neighbors and ask questions, and you know. Seek out somebody who's doing it. Seek out a couple people who are doing it. You know, get some input from them. You know, and you know, make your decision on if you're going to add row cleaners, if you're going to use a no-till coal, or what kind of vehicle. You know, all those things. Make those based those decisions based on some real data that you've gotten from from neighbors, some research that you've done on the side. And then, most importantly, don't be so proud that you're not willing to change later on because. Uh, you know, yeah, you spent a couple hundred dollars a row on something and come to find out that I don't really like it or it's not really working, you know, when you start doing the digging or when you start getting in the conditions. And you just have to be willing to say, well, that sucked. I'm not doing it. Um, and, and I'm going to move on to something else. And, you know, I think some, I just think we get caught up in that too many times. We get so, you know, so stubborn about it that I, I made the right decision and by gosh, I'm going to make it work. Sometimes you can't do it that way. You, you have to just drop that and, and, and move to something else. The last thing I will say is, like on on V closers, uh, have a have an assortment of them ready to go for the season. You know, it was one lesson learned this past year for us was, you know, we had drag chains, we had spike closers, and we also had uh, cover crops that were you know five and six feet high. We had wrapping, we had dragging, we had to come up with a solution. The solution was we had to take the spike off, we had to take the drag chain off. End of story. 
Uh, so we ended up with two rubbers back on there, and you know we made we made the most of it. So, you know, you just have to adapt sometimes. I think you know, uh, looking at today's equipment, just about every line of planter that's sold is heavy enough to do no-till now. Uh, you know, back when Bill and I started. Uh, it was a conventional planter that you put cement blocks on or wheel weights or whatever and hope to hell it had enough strength to handle that weight. But today the planters are all designed to do that because most of them are designed for minimum till. And as you transition, we're talking about transitioning, so you know, you're know you probably going to go from uh, a conventional type situation to no-till before you ever get into covers. And some of that ground is going to be tougher. It's going to be harder. And that's when you need to look at what's going on. As you do more no-till and use cover crops, you'll be changing some of the things that you might have put on to start your transition, like Brent said, you know. Because um, there's a great knowledge of things. And, you know, if, if uh, I always thought it was always best for us. I never went whole hog, you know. We never had a big planter. I mean, a six or an eight row. But if something come out new that Don come out with or Yetter or... or Somebody just, you know, buy one unit and put it on there and see how it works for a little bit. You know, it's a lot easier to spend $600 a row on one row than that much for every row and multiply that out, you know. And then if it works, uh, either take time to change them all before as you're planting or just say, well, next year we'll change it, you know. And uh, Bill's done a lot. Of, he's done a lot of experiments, too. Yeah, I know. Time for the old legend. Old legend, yes. <laughs> Well, you know, I, I sat here listening to this conversation, and I think, gee, how how fortunate we are today with the, with the equipment that we have. I mean, the guys bought a, a new uh, Case 36 row, a big, beautiful planter about three years ago that just, you know, it goes over the field, it gets the job done, and you can't say. Randall was down there one day, and he argued that the field hadn't been planted. You couldn't see where we'd been. But you know, when when I when he assigned me this uh, <laughs> this panel, transitioning. I mean, it, it's only took well, it took me about forty years to get to where um, we could actually say that we were maintaining yield. Uh, this planter that they bought is the first planter we've ever had that wasn't cobbled together from uh, from just. <laughs> Spare parts from Zier and NIH, I about drove the, the dealers nuts trying to, to get different things. You talk about going whole hog, I mean, back when I was really young and foolish, I mean, we, we, uh, we uh, started the year with a till planter that we'd made. And that was the only thing we had, and it was, you know, do or die. Um, uh, through those years, uh, we we probably had years that we lost yield. Uh, I know we did. We probably, I mean, we think we made up with it, with for it, with uh, lack of cost and lack of, uh, less fuel, less labor, learning how to farm more land. The neighbors couldn't figure out how in the world we were farming so much land. Uh, well, we weren't doing as much work. Um, you know, the no-till colder was a great, great breakthrough of our time. Uh, and yes, we've progressed beyond that. Our soil quality's got so good that uh, that that IH planter slices right through there. I'd have to say one of the first things that we learned way back is we absolutely had to have a residue cover, or we really lost stand and lost yield. And then I'd also say that we never really would say I'd say our transition ended when we really went uh, continuous no-till and we really started seeing the results of that improvement in soil quality. So guys, uh, when you talk about machinery, let's count our blessings. Uh, we have the technology that's just, and we have a proven technology in no-till. I just can't understand that uh, ever farmers not farming. And, uh, I, they, he put me on the television this morning, and I probably said something that I'll hear about. But uh, I, I said that, uh, you know, if you're not no-tilling, you're not a good farmer. <laughs> all right, one more question for Bill. Uh, tell me about all the additional equipment you've added to your early riser planter. 
don't think any. Right. Well, I knew that was going to be the answer. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if you want to elaborate on that, but your early riser does the job without having to buy extra uh, equipment. Any comment on that, Lemko? No. All right. Uh, all right. Any more questions about uh, about the the planter? Oh, we'll let Bob ask one. <laughs> Forty years since you guys started, and it would make it more difficult to start a no-till today. Oh no, not with the equipment we have and the know-how that we have, and the herbicides. Don't forget the big breakthrough back then was Roundup. I mean, we're on 20-inch rows at home, and, and gee, I wish we weren't. I wouldn't advise that. But back when we had Johnson grass in the river bottoms and and no way to fight it, we, we brought the rose in to get a canopy as quickly as we can. And uh, uh, I just think it's easier today than it's ever been. Uh, while I'm commenting, I heard some questions back there. So far as uh, government involvement and, and incentive for no-till, I guess I look at it that we've had this technology for all these years. And uh, I'm, I, I think that those government incentives ought to be for us trying things that really aren't quite proven. Uh, let's, uh, let's concentrate on that cover crop. Let's concentrate on fertilizer placement and some of the things that we really want to get farmers started doing. Uh, I would be a little ashamed to take money uh, for, for no-till because, gosh, we know how to do that. And, I, uh, and to go along with Bill, I, and I really think, you know, with today's equipment and so on, it's going to be easier to transition than when we were doing it 50 years ago, uh, just because of the technology has been so great. Hybrids are so much better. Uh, we can learn to get by with less product per acre. I mean, when Bill and I started, it was not uncommon to put five or six or ten pounds of atrazine on. You know, that's what we had. <laughs> Atrazine and 2,4-D. We don't do that anymore. You know, we use, we use more sense to what we're doing, you know. And uh, to me, there's never been, you know, all the years and all the farms that I've taken over and all the farms I've lost because somebody else offered more money or it, it, they grew houses on it. Um, I can't ever say that we lost uh, money or, or we may have lost a few bushel in yield, but we didn't lose any money because we didn't have all that time and iron invested into doing the tillage. So to me, there is no yield drag anymore. There don't have to be with the knowledge we have, you know, with placement of fertilizer, with use of cover crops, learning to use the right herbicides, uh, going to a peer group, finding out how to do it right. I mean, uh, Bill and I both know that... Uh, Fifty years ago, when I started, there was nobody to talk to, <laughs> and even the university didn't know. You know, and it was trial and error, like Bill said. You know, we built planters. Yeah, we had Triplet and and uh, Sam Bone and all those guys. Yeah. So today's technology is so much better, and I don't see any way, reason to say you'll have a yield loss by transition. And I'm saying you're going to have a yield gain because I think as we improve the uh, microclimate underneath the soil will improve our soil qualities, will improve the quality of the grain, and uh, maintain and even surpass conventional yields today. All right, Brent, what's next? Well, there was a question about drainage and improvement of drainage, but also the uh, eliminating compaction layers, and in my mind, those kind of go hand in hand because you can't have good drainage. All right, compaction and drainage. So who wants to start with that one? Bill Richards. I'll talk about compaction because I've worked with Randall for many years now. Uh, we're on a controlled traffic system, have been for 15 to 20 years. Uh, we plant with a 60-foot with a, a wide planter, or we used to, we still do, of course. Uh, we were skipping the two rows behind the wheels, so we followed the same tram lines, the same tracks for all these years. 
and folks, those those, <laughs> those tracks get harder and harder, and uh, and the ground in between uh, is getting better and better. Uh, so one of the ways to address compaction uh, is with a controlled traffic system, and uh, it that really fits no-till because uh, you're only making one pass. Uh, we've arranged the anhydrous bar and the fertilizer uh, applicator to that same 60-foot uh, 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 track system. Uh, the new planter uh, is, has guidance on it, and it's supposed to guide down those tracks. Uh, uh, the old tracks that we could look out and see were, were far superior as far as we're concerned, but we've had the, the advantage of uh, uh, controlled traffic all these years and, and really a precision planning system. So I think that really goes with no-till. Let me add a point. I know, Bill, everything's on those tracks except the combine. Oh, yeah. And, and here's the way I look at a controlled traffic system. Many of you probably have that same thought. Oh, my God, I'll never get the combine to match. Uh, so if you did have everything lined up perfectly, either 30-foot overall width or 40-foot and everything was on the same tracks, I would just give that an A grade in terms of compaction. If everything is in line except for the soybean harvest, in other words, your corn head does match up with the tracks, but the soybean, it's just going to be a wider header. You're just not going to give up that capacity. Then that might be an A minus because that's only every other year. And another point is that usually in the fall of the year, the soil is drier, and if you're in continuous no-till, then it's going to resist compaction better. Uh, if the corn head doesn't match up, then then every year the combine's running on uh, uh, new tracks. Or, well, it may be running on the same <laughs> combine track <laughs> year after year, uh, but not the other tracks. So that might I'd grade that as a B. And and the real point of that grading system is that don't just say, oh, I couldn't do control traffic because one or two things don't match up perfectly. Uh, I'd suggest go ahead and do it, and then as you can, over time, as you trade equipment, make sure everything does match up the best you can. But if your combine doesn't, uh, uh, you can live with that. B is a passing grade. Yeah, B is a passing. B is a pretty good grade. Yeah. And if you're going to do that, don't have that 1,000 bushel grain cart going out and making a U-turn out in the middle of the field yeah. because that really screws up everything. But uh, drainage is really important. Uh, nothing... I will agree, nothing replaces tile, nothing replaces tile drainage. If we owned all the land that we farm, we would probably borrow enough money to get it tiled. But in our situation, we rent 99% of the land that we farm. So we spend our time trying to figure out what cover crops will give us a deep rooted. I think the first thing you have to consider if you're a corn bean rotation guy and you've got poor drainage, you need to go to wheat. You need to go to a three-year rotation. Put the wheat in a rotation so you can get some big, massive cover crops planted after wheat and no double crop beans because you're not building soil with double crop beans. And get those roots down there to loosen that soil, break up those compacted layers, and then you'll get water infiltration. You know, uh, if you're in a corn bean rotation, you can't get a cover crop to grow big enough to give you those deep roots to break up those compacted layers that's 12 to 18 inches deep. You know, uh, look at brassicas because they tend to have more uh, pounds per point of growth. You know, uh, I was told not too long ago that a reddish can put 1,250 pounds of pressure on the growing point going through the soil. So, and they will actually lift the soil as they grow so they do do some tillage, you know. So I think we can learn to use cover crops to improve some of our water problems, you know. And uh, once you break through that hard pan, we've seen some of the water problems go away, you know. Uh, I've seen guys tile a 15 foot on center and I can take you to my neighbor's farm today because my wife just came here and we had three and a half inches of water yesterday. And uh, she says there's 37 acres underwater on his farm we have the same size field with the same pocket. We have rye grown in that field and there was no water in the field. And we don't have any tile. 
I mean, his water's still not getting to his tile because of the compaction layers, you know. So I think cover crops would work. It's just learning how to do that and talk to the talk to your seed dealers and find out what they recommend to use. The cover crops definitely um, are a, a quick impact for compaction and helping infiltration of water. But when you think about transitioning, um, going from you know whether it's at rotational tillage, but you know where you're still running field cultivators and stuff, I think the, a really good tool is an airway. And I think you use that during that transition period. I think the cover crops with it are win-win. Are, are but, you know, again, it, it helps with some of that surface compaction that occurs. And it seems like when we, when we get caught into a corn bean rotation that's been pounded a lot, it seems like there's a lot of, a lot of hardness on the surface. And I think that airway helps with that. But I think, you know, again, as you set up goals, the goal would be to eventually phase that out um, as the plan. Um, helps with the drainage, helps with the air, and that's, those are the things we're after. But the other thing with drainage, too, um, if you think that you need to improve some drainage out there, I would encourage you to bite the bullet sooner than later because one frustration that comes from our end is, you know, you have a field that's in, a, in the system for a long period of time, and it's finally time where you're going to do some drainage on it. And the last thing you want to have to be faced with then is to do tillage to level it, and it's a it's a real struggle. Uh, we've tried a lot of different things. S you know, some things are better than others, but you still end up having to do some tillage, and you just hate to do uh, you hate to do that once you've had it in eight, nine, ten, twelve plus years. All right, what's what's next? Oh, do you want more information concerning how do you prevent yield lag? Uh, many of you have heard Barry Fisher, and I probably am not remembering accurately his four-step process. Do you, rem do you know what it is, Brett? Um, I don't know. I don't know if it's exactly Barry's, but I think we we think the same way, and that is, is you set yourself up for success and not failure. So if this is year one going into no-till, you don't no-till corn in year one. Okay, so if you believe in that theory that some people say that it takes four, five, six, seven years to, you know, to get your ground to be able to adapt to no-till, you know, it's going to vary from farm to farm, from soil type to soil type, operation to operation. But if you believe and subscribe to that theory, then what you're going to do is you're going to do a corn or I'm sorry, a, a beans, wheat rotation, a beans, rye, beans, and then into wheat potentially. But you're going to throw three, as many different crops ahead of that corn and get that corn shoved back to at least like the third or the fourth year of being in the no-till to set yourself up for a successful corn crop. And I think if you do that, then I don't think you're facing that so-called yield lag that's out there that's, that becomes a hindrance. Yeah, and I think that's why I brought up in the beginning, you, you really got to dig. I mean, get a shovel, get a backhoe, whatever. Dig beforehand. Look what those corn roots are telling you out there. You know, do we have layers that are going to restrict that? Because, I, I mean, I've, se I've seen it time and time again. Number one, not only in one growing season, but you get to that third or fourth year of, of growing corn, and that's where guys get soured when they're converting to no-till. And I think, Brett... Uh, address that a, a little bit, but you know, I think a lot of us who who have started out in no-till and haven't addressed some of those key issues, I'll just use a single-season corn crop. You see where the where uh, <clears throat> you plant that corn out there, and it takes off, and it gets to be about the uh, uh, V4, or V5, and and it seems to stall out as you've got those layers in the ground, and those roots tend to resize themselves, and and that, and so it's you know, so it's important to, to address those type of things ahead of time before we get you know, going with the corn crop. So, all right. Uh, any, let me interrupt because we've got a list of questions up here. But anything else that's come up from the audience that you want to answer to? What cover are you using after the wheat? 
You want to get into cover crops? All right. After, and let me, the question was, what cover do you use after wheat to get the most value out of it? Um, something that came up as we were talking in, in our room last night, and I know this is silly, but uh, Dave and others are going to talk about the value of having wheat in the rotation so you can get good soil improvement from the cover crop. Uh, so I just raised a question. Uh, George was there. Uh, what would happen if, and, and why, do, why don't you raise more wheat? Uh, Ohio farmers used to raise a lot of wheat, Iowa or uh, Indiana. Money, yeah. Uh, so, so, what would we do with the wheat? Well, my comment was if you're getting so much value, uh, would you still do it, Dave Brandt, if wheat was zero? In other words, would you put wheat in a rotation if you got nothing? out of the wheat itself? Would you get enough value out of the succeeding cover crops? I don't know that's a shocking question, but uh, uh, do you really get so much value? And I think, <laughs> let, me, let me go back, to just the current price of wheat. Are you going to get enough value from the cover crop that year that it's going to make it pay off? Well, I, think, I personally think we get enough value to have wheat in our rotation uh, because of the fact we get another 30-day window of growth for our covers, which means they get bigger. Uh, we look to, I like to look for diversity. Uh, the first year of a farm that gets wheat in it does not get much diversity in the wheat. We tend to go with peas and radishes, precisionally planted, because that's like a $16, $18 cost of seed. You know, the planter's set in a shed, so, you know, it's costing me dollars setting a shed or whether it's, whether it's being pulled behind a tractor. So I don't know what that figure is. Somebody could tell me. I've never figured it out. But anyhow, uh, when we do that, we can get the compaction issue addressed right away because the reddishes break through and help eliminate the compaction. We're growing some nitrogen or storing some nitrogen from the atmosphere, uh, and that can range from 10 pounds to 300, depending on how good a legume crops you got growing with it and how many, how much the reddish picks up, and what kind of fall you have and what kind of spring. You know, if it's a wet spring, we don't get as much nitrogen. If it's a dry spring, we get more nitrogen. Those are things you have to learn to take soil samples. Let, let some soil lab tell you how much nitrogen you got in that field rather than just address it. And then looking at uh, down the road, the next time that six, three years later when that goes to wheat, then we look at our big blends so that we can really start reducing some of the nutrients we need to buy, you know. And yes, if wheat was nothing, I probably wouldn't plant wheat. I would probably plant barley or rye or something like that to create a market. You know, there may be a big market in Ohio for barley in the next two or three years. You know, uh, I'm hearing lots of rumors. They want 50,000 bushel of barley grown in Ohio in the next two years. Acres, rather. Acres. Acres. So that's, that's you know, that's going to replace almost all the wheat that's grown in Ohio, you know. Uh, and to me, if we go from a corn bean rotation to a corn bean small grain rotation, uh, we, we can have plus corn and plus beans. There's an argument. Somebody says six bushel of corn, five bushel of beans. University told me it's ten and nine. I don't care what it is, but if you've got a plus, you take that plus and put it toward the wheat. You know? You don't put it towards the corn or bean crop because you wouldn't have had it if you didn't have wheat in the rotation or a cereal crop. You know? <coughs> Maybe you just need to grow enough cereal so you have rye that you can harvest and clean and plant it for your cover, you know, because you can do that if you want to. You don't have to buy it out of the bag. Uh, you know, this would be a good time, Brett. You've got a couple of videos lined up up here of managing cover crops, right? Yeah. Days. Uh, yeah. Um, I'm sure you saved time to talk about slugs. All right, we'll talk about slugs, but uh, all right, we got a quick. Do you want to show the video? It's, uh, Jeff can help you out on that. Well, a little bit about a little bit of while Brett's setting that up. Uh, you know, slugs and voles, uh, uh, wireworms, cutworms are all problems. You'll need to learn to address them. Uh, as we move to no-till, we're seeing lots of beneficials come. Uh, you know, I think you can help yourself if you got tree lines or or open ditches. I don't see why we're not planting some beneficial things 
in that buffer area to bring insects to help us out. Uh, we look at uh, crabbit beetle. Uh, it really takes care of slugs. We've seen slug retention done by the reddish because it fumigates the soil in the, in the spring. Uh, and uh, it may take a year or two, but they are, you can do some work with reddishes and with a crabbit beetle that really will help you uh, deter that, you know. Go ahead, Brent. Uh, 